Okay, well, I think it's 11 o'clock, so we'll get started. And uh, kind of like uh, 2020, 2021 has been for the classroom, we have some people on Zoom, some people watching it on Facebook, and then, of course, us sharing mutual space. This whole year, really since March, or even before that, I think, convocation has been on Zoom, but sometimes you make exceptions for things. And John Howley is something that I feel like we cannot reproduce via Zoom. It's a lived experience. So we have to be in the space. And for all of you, of course, you know Doc and all of his many years, different ways that he's impacted your life from classroom, but really the extra classroom stuff that he's poured in. I know that some of you are kind of disciples or been mentored by Dr. Howie. And um, what we're going to do today is this really a conversation. Uh, just a conversation with some questions that we raised over Dr. Howie's life. And we thought that John would sit down and uh, we are recording this, we'll, we'll put it online, but really we thought it would just be a real space to ask some questions and explore. But also to frame it around health journeys and, and what that's like too. So we've got about 10 questions, but I suspect we won't get to all of those. Uh, we'll just kind of go with what we can. Um, so, uh, but anyways, so I can, I can say this, uh, Professor Emeritus of Psychology, Dr. John Howie, and you taught here how many years? 30. 30 years. This is my 30th year. 30th year, okay. So, we'll get started, and I know that your life, in many ways, has been dedicated to justice. Right? You've been, kind of, we would call you now a justice warrior, uh, right? Um, and you've been helping people, especially, expand their horizons. You really try to open students' eyes to a lot of things. So, who modeled this for you? Who gave you that fire to be an activist? Ancestral karma. Um, but I mean, you, you find out later on in life that a lot of the stuff that you're doing is a repetition of stuff that your ancestors did in a different modality and stuff. And so, in some ways, it was my parents. My father was known as the end doctor in town down in Alabama. So, you go out in Alabama, there's a little social injustice in the 50s and 60s now. <laughs> we didn't get there until 59 or something. But it was, it says on the license plate, Heart of Dixie, so you can see the issues that they had. I think 2% of the people voted for the liberal candidate at one point, and of course the rest of them were voting for George Wallace. George Wallace was in power for like 12 years or something like that, until somebody shot him and missed. Man, I swear, you get the assassins missing in all the wrong places. So, um, my father, uh, did that. He was the integrated, was the, had the first integrated classroom, not classroom, excuse me, the first integrated waiting room in his pediatrician's office. And so um, that that was an issue there. And it was it was dangerous to do that back then. The KKK started calling us up and saying, well, we're gonna, you know, kidnap your kids and we're gonna, gonna firebomb your, I mean, we're gonna burn a cross up on your house. But back then, you know, there was no cell phone, so, you know, as long as they're on the phone, they're not burning the cross, right? And the dad said when they were going to kidnap the kids, well, I've got eight. Could you take John? He really... This <laughs> 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 is well see him call. <laughs> i got extra. Well, he didn't quite say that. That's the way I tell the story. But um, it, it, was, it, was, it was dangerous kind of thing, but it was important to do. And you can see that in justice. So when you're... It's kind of in your face. When Tace and I talk, and Tace was in South Africa with that apartheid stuff. And you can see, oh yeah, there's that tension. But you also know what side social justice is on. You're not like clueless about, oh yeah, no, this is this is the right side of things. And this is where the, the what is it, the, the arc of justice mm -hmm. ends. This is where it's bending towards. And then to have it come back up again, all over again in 2016 and 17, I mean, it's like, where the hell did this come from? This is not 1968. Or did George Wallace actually win 1968? <laughs> which is what it felt like, right? So there's certain things that, that there's certain fundamental questions that have to be answered. And they don't change over time very much. Uh, I wish they did. But the same issues seem to keep cropping up over and over and over again. And then my Uncle John, he was a philosophy professor. Um, mm -hmm. Well, 
He tried to be a preacher in South Carolina. That didn't work out so good <laughs> in the 1950s. Especially, they actually went to a KKK rally. He and my aunt, and they were just taking notes and stuff. And then the, those people started, hey, what are you doing here? You know, kind of thing. And anyway, it was, they left. But so you, you had to have a certain amount of bravery, and at the same time, you kind of had to joke about it. I mean, you have to find the comical little thing in it, okay? When we were at the, uh, that rally in 2017, we had the people from Charlottesville here. They came here first to practice. <laughs> and fortunately, we had the proper police response, which is a whole lot of people, separate the two sides, and it's going to be okay. Plus, there's 40 snipers on the roof, so we heard. I don't know whether there were 40 snipers there or not. As far as everybody was concerned, and it's an open carry state, so it's probably better that they think the snipers are on the roof, whether they're there or not. Um, but the, the police here did a really good response to that. And, and you're, you're calm, and you don't sort of incite riots like they did in 1968 at the, the convention there. So, so what, you're, I mean, what I hear is your parents, or your dad who had an integrated waiting room as a dog, your uncle who is this philosophy professor, you really come from a line of activists oh, yeah. that motivated your, and, and when your dad is integrating his waiting room, about how old were you when that was happening? Oh, I was like eight, nine years old. It was, it was, no, it would be 10. It was in 1962. Okay, now so, Alabama and stuff. And so they were standing up for that stuff, and it, it actually comes out of the, the church tradition. The church was a really powerful force with the initial civil rights stuff. The black churches, but the white churches as well. On occasion, <laughs> we kind of left the, the uh, United Methodist Church uh, when they didn't allow some black people into it back in the 60s. And so my parents walked out and stuff. And they started a, a fellowship that went on for years and years and years. And they're still best friends and stuff. Mm. Of about 40 or 50 people that would meet at people's houses and stuff. And they had a, a minister and stuff like that. that would come. So, so you really, you're. The parents of your, I mean, your cur your, the courage of your parents and modeling that and being willing yeah. to, here you are at 10, very impressionable, and you see that they're willing to literally kind of risk their lives. Oh, yeah, for their you also see how stupid you are, because I was like, at 10, I was like, yeah, we could have a gay kids, and we could all wear Confederate, you know, hats, and, and have Confederate flags, and my mom said, no, no, we're... We're on the other side of this. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to realize your social context. Okay. And that was the other thing I was talking about. There's a, there's a social context in which you grow up. And when, where those issues are, I mean, you start opening your eyes to those, you, you have to own up to them. And, and you don't have choices. And this goes back to, to early in, in the history of Kentucky and stuff. And, and well, the history of politics. With the progressive Democrats were back in you know, the 40s and 50s. And, you had some really progressive people. There, there's an undercurrent of that that lasted from, I guess, from from uh, the FDR and stuff like that. In the 30s. Yeah. Well, you have to have this like pocket of progressive people, and I know that's one of the roles that you have played over these last 30 years here at, at UPI or Piper College. Just being a pocket, right? Kind of a refuge for for students who are interested in certain things. Um, and I know one of the topics you've been really passionate about. Is modeling, you know, love for the environment, taking care of Mother Earth. I mean, that's been a really important you know, passion. The river, Pikeville River. How much you uh, kind of thought about that, cared for that. So I wonder, could you share with us some of that passion? Of why is being in nature so important to you, and why do you think it's so important to other people? It heals. I mean, you get out in nature, and it heals. The nice thing about Appalachian, one of the one of the other questions you were asking about, how, how, why have I stayed in Pikeville? So long. Because the nature here is great. You've got beautiful natural stuff. And the, the human nature here is also great. Because you get all these diamonds in the rough around here. And that's the sort of students you mentor is you've got these, and they come from the head of hollow and stuff. I mean, Mud Creek and everything. <laughs> you know. Marbone. I mean, there's certain places in our area that don't have the best of reputation. If you don't know anybody that hollow, you maybe maybe you shouldn't go there. But if you know somebody there, you're safe. You're good. Okay. And the people uh, of Appalachia have a real sense of nature, mm. and 
that's one of the things that in classes, you sit there and you talk about going in nature, and they've got a home place that they used to go to, and so they have a real, uh, it's, it's in their bones to have a sense of what nature means, and th that kind of sense of it. Now, it can be overwhelmed by the whole kind of systems like that, but you get, you get that kind of push, and I think that's endemic and, and implicit in every human being that there is. They always have that kind of view. Um, and so that ecological awareness, and at the first, at the first um, what, what is it called, Earth Day, right? Yeah, well, everybody was supposed to go to school, you know, not in a car, right? Okay. So we had a horse, <laughs> this big black horse we had. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me see if I can tell this story. Anyway, so we had this horse, and so me and my friend Ed, we went, we were riding the horse. <laughs> and we were trading off. But my aunt, my friend Anthony's like six foot three, okay, <laughs> and really dark, okay. He was on the football team and stuff too. But anyway, he he happened to be on the horse when we got to school. I think he kind of planned it that way. <laughs> and so Deborah Dale comes running out. And she's just blonde and stuff. She, Can I ride? Can I ride? She, so we hoist her up there, and she rides on by. And the oh, yeah, well, uh, the the principal, right? He saw him riding by. And what are you going to do with the horse when you're in school? <laughs> hadn't I mean, thought that through. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought that through. You see, it's got an inner courtyard. You know, remember those things that they'd have an inner courtyard like that? And so we had an inner courtyard, and just getting him, we got him across the linoleum into the courtyard, and there was one tree there we could tie him to. So we had him that, right? It was done. But you know, the principal. Well, the boy who owns the horse in the inner courtyard, please come to the principal's office. And I was like, oh. This is not going to be so good. And Anthony looks at me and goes, hey, it's not my horse. <laughs> and I'm like going down to the principal's office. And so he's going, well, I'm going to call your daddy. And I said, 533-7258. He says, what's that? That's the telephone number. 533-7258. So, so he, he calls him. I said, I'm going to call him. Really? I said, go ahead. And he comes down there. My dad is thinking, I, now we hadn't talked about this, right? But Dad was like, um, I got seven more kids coming here afterwards. We need to get rid of this guy. So me and Dad, with unspoken kind of things, started baiting, trying to get him to, you know, if we could just get him to hit Dad, yeah, then we could get him fired, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we got him. And he was called Turkey Neck because he had this, this neck that would just turn around and he was like, yeah. And he was, get out of my office. I never want to see you here again. So he, he, he just kicked us both out, and, and he never did it. The next year, when my sister burned the Confederate flag in the smoking court, he, he didn't even call my parents. So I have, this, I have this image of, you know, integrated waiting rooms, you ride a horse, your sister burns the Confederate flag. I sense that in your area, the Howies were an eccentric, known family. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were still well known as me and that. So okay. It so, didn't change over time. My dad was, uh, he was supposed to be dead about 10 years before he died. I'm going to try to follow in his footsteps there, okay? <laughs> But anyway, he was supposed to be gone, but uh, they went back to Huntsville, Alabama, because they were living down in Galveston, Texas. He was teaching them. That's the other part of the ancestral karma. You can call it genetic heritage if you want, but ancestral karma is a nice way to put it, because you can see the continuity of how things go down. So on the Mitchell side, one of the Mitchells started Friends World College up in uh, New York. It's called Global University or something. But it's the Catholic, it's the uh, Quaker. There's a connection to the Quaker that we have somewhere underneath the surface. I didn't know that. And I became a draft dodger without even knowing that. So, um, I mean, back to Vietnam yeah. kind of stuff. And that, again, was another one of those things that after the fact, people go, yeah, no, that was probably not a good engagement that we were doing. Here. Well, it seems like you have this path of where you, you know, do these things and then reflecting, on reflecting back on them, you say, you see all these connections, right? Connections that go yeah. way back. Yes. So one of the things that you've been so famous for is this helping students interpret dreams, making those like larger connections. Um, your, your classes still, I mean, if you would 
you know, teach it today, the class will be filled with the Howie's Dream Class. Right? Yeah. I really thought for a while that was the actual technical name of the class, Howie's Dream Class. It turns out it was something else. But um, <laughs> as you have taught about dreams, right, and people have wanted to, who filled the room trying to figure it out, you know, what should people know about dreams and how to make those connections for themselves? Well, I, I call the course Dreams into Consciousness, and I've been teaching it for actually 20 years. Uh, this is 30 years now. Anyway, I taught it the, the first spring semester, 1992, mm. back there. Because they that was the great thing about Pikeville College. They would let you do anything you wanted to <laughs> as long as you did it pretty well. And nobody could, well, people complained. So, but anyway, they would usually let you do whatever you wanted, and they recognized that you had the confidence to do what you were doing. And so I got to teach, I got away with teaching all sorts of stuff. <laughs> made up this echo psychology stuff 10 years ago. And that, well, I didn't make it up, but I found this stuff. And it's like, I'm really lucky to find books. They jump off the shelves and hit me. No, but they, their books will just kind of appear when you really need that. And that, that has consistently happened. That's not me doing it, okay? And that's one of the things that in dreams, you, you have to get over the ego consciousness. Ego consciousness in dreams is stupid, okay? That's why they always seem strange to you and bizarre, because you don't understand the dream world. But what I get people to do is go back into the dream world, okay? And I'm not able to do this myself, so I feel like Moses who never got to the <laughs> You can see it, but you can't get there. I can't get there. <laughs> no, I'm good to get people there, though. And so one of the things I use is dream reentry. And then I found out that the, the shamanism worked with that as well, because the shamans use drum beats and stuff. And so I, I, my sense of rhythm is not very good, even though I have a drum, I do a drum circle, but I, I do a tape thing of it, because it's just a repetitive beat. And it does seem eight or nine people out of 10 can go back into their dream with the shaman, with the shamanic drumming, okay? Because that helps them get into that space. Some people, some people, they're just distracted by it, they don't want to hear it. So, so I was conjoining those two things in terms of the dreams and in terms of the shamanism stuff, which is, is universal among humans. I mean, evolutionarily speaking, everybody went through the shaman phase and the hunter-gatherers. That, that's always been there. And it's, it's that deep in people's soul that they pick up on it. They go, oh, that makes sense. Because in the shamanic journeys, I have people go down and find the, um, the what you call your totem animal or your guardian animal and stuff like that. And that, I've always, and again, something I haven't been able to do and I'm able to teach. And I don't know why that is. Although a friend of mine, Daniel, once said that, um, oh yeah, yeah, uh, John, the reason you can't go there is you're already there. Which I thought was, I don't, it's probably not true, but <laughs> I'll go with it. <laughs> um, so the, the, the dream class is, is always surprising to me. And that's the reason I hate those eight week classes. It takes me eight weeks to get people to the point where they go, oh, I see what he's talking about. I don't, I don't think it gels until about eight weeks in. And then you're like, oh, they catch on. They suddenly realize what it is you're talking about. And then you can go with it. But it, it doesn't happen. It, it doesn't happen according to a COVID schedule. Well, it sounds like in many ways, <laughs> people who are interested in exploring their dreams, they really need a guide, or they need like a community to do that. Ah, the community helps a lot. And I, I, I've used this as a trick several times, okay? Because I'll invite students who were in a class before to come back to class, and then they don't think I'm quite as crazy. <laughs> they think, well, he may be crazy, but he made somebody else be crazy in the same kind of way. So that's a good thing, right? Because they really have a sense of, oh, that can be done. And once they see that it can be done, I mean, people accuse me of hypnosis and stuff like that. I don't know how to do hypnosis, okay? Uh, but they, they, they go under to that place, and it's a, that's what I wanted to say. The dream world is, is really a place that you can reaccess in a conscious mind. You can do it also from the dream space, and it's called, um, it's called lucid dreaming, where you're awake within the dream. So you're in this paradoxical space, both the dream world and not the dream world. 
And so when we go back into the dream in class, and I guide him down um, into the dream, then they think weird things start happening then, okay? Because people will say, oh yeah, I see something else behind you in that dream. Thinking, some of them get into that space so much that they can see into the space that they're in. And they turn around, oh yeah, that thing is there. So you get, anyway, those are that, those are synchronicity kind of things, meaningful coincidences that happen. Mm. Um, well, that seems like those are the moments when you, as a teacher, can really help students turn that light on, right? You add some oh, yeah. kind of clarity and they get it. And I think one of the interesting things about your teaching, the iconic teaching that you've done here over these years, and not just here, I mean, I think that you are a teacher, so where, wherever you are, you will be teaching, right? Not just in a formal classroom, but you're teaching. On my deathbed, hopefully. Right, I mean, but, but for you also, there has been this sense that when your name is mentioned, you have a, these group of students who will, I mean, want to move heaven and earth to be around you. You've been able to build that rapport, that energy, that... No, no, that, that, I, I didn't do that. That happened. Okay. No, and, uh, no it's very important because this is, this is what happens in dreams, too. If you, if you still, from the egocentric point of view, and that, that little eye that you have, that, that doesn't get you places. And you have another question about when I travel and stuff, yeah. and what, what lessons you can get from traveling. Traveling, you get an itinerary, you have some general notion of where you're going and stuff, but forget about it if it doesn't work out. I mean, it didn't work out, and, and you get over it. We went to the Galapagos, or tried to go to the Galapagos. <laughs> we had had four different tickets to go to the Galapagos Islands, and then you had to have a special test, right? And I, we got the quickie test, and I got speeding ticket that we still hadn't got fixed. Honey, you're supposed to fix that ticket. <laughs> anyway, I, I was going 70 past, uh, is that Biscuit World or something? Because we, we had to be down to, to Atlanta at 5 o'clock that evening when the plane left. I mean, the plane was leaving at 5. And so we got there at 8 o'clock in the morning at this place, and we thought, oh no, but there's this long list of people who got there before us. So we weren't going to get there until 9 or 10 or 11 or something get the test, and we got the quickie test, and we got it, and then we can drive. She can drive six hours to land. That's good. <laughs> anyway. Need to delete that. Yeah, we will, we'll, we'll change. What is that? That you uh, you were able to get to Atlanta. You were able to tr try to go to the lava. No, we, things we, don't work out. No, no. Yeah, well, it, that one didn't work out at all because we were 15 minutes late or something, so um, we didn't get on that flight. So. Then the next time we got on. But see, you had to have your test four days, within four days before you got to Quito, Ecuador. But to get to Quito, Ecuador, you got to go to Atlanta. Then you got to go to Quito, right? So it's going to take a whole day to do that. Plus, in the long run, when it takes four days to get the results from, that doesn't come back, and, you know. So you can't get down there. But we had the quickie one. So we got to the airport in Quito, Ecuador, and dad gum if we couldn't. We couldn't go to Galapagos because we had the wrong test. We had the quickie one instead of the longer one, the PCR test instead of, you know, the, we had the wrong test. So it was, we were all upset. So you, but it sounds like you really had to be very flexible. Oh yeah, to make, to well, make Emma that. said, well, I want a massage while the boys go riding horses on volcanoes. Can you do that? And there was this lady in the airport who helped us out. And that's the thing. Things happen that help you that you have to be aware of, especially when you're traveling. And those things will appear. And that's what I mean by synchronicity or meaningful coincidences. They happen when you travel a lot. And that's one of the things I've learned from traveling is you have to expect that. But you have to expect that in your journey through life, too. What needs to happen is going to happen. Now, it's not necessarily going to happen really easily, and you're going to have to find rabbit holes, and you're going to have to, I mean, we had, Emma found that rabbit hole for us to go, to go to this wonderful 250-year-old hacienda with, uh, just don't mention the Inca, okay, I, I kept talking about the Peruvian, but 600 years ago, the Inca came in and massacred 40,000 people, turned this lake red, so they're, they're still ticked off, I mean, you don't want to mention it, okay? Ecuador was the only country in South America that would let us in, that would let Americans in. Oh. Because they use American money and they needed more Americans to come in and spend some more of their money. Because it's the only country that also just has American money. 
Well, yes, and I think yeah. that one of the things you're highlighting about travel is this this idea of flexibility, the people that you meet on the journey, oh, yeah. um, uh, kind of. But also, you have to push and you have to wrestle and you have to be creative and you have to be interested. I think one of the things that I so deeply appreciate about you is just how interested and uh, curious you are. Um, and, I, and I wonder, you know, as an educator, as a teacher who is very curious, education is changing. It feels like it's being very standardized and the kind of organic things that you do maybe are, are becoming more are, are less and less. But, so, but if you were to talk to educators today or students, what would you say is so important or most important to your philosophy of teaching? Uh, I didn't really care whether they wanted to go into psychology or not, okay? Because they, what they have to do is find their own passion. And that has ranged anywhere from being a law student to being a med student to being osteopathic to being all those different things, you know, to go on. That's what you have to do. You have to find your passion. That's what those four years here are about. I'm not sure that, I was talking to somebody the other day. I think girls should probably not go to college until they're 22 and guys until they're 25 or 26, if the guy's ready. I mean, that may not be ready yet, but there's, there's a, but it is what it is. 18 to 22 is what you sort of have. But what they need to find is what their true passion that they really are curious about and can go and do without actually having to work it. Because if you find your passion and what you want to do, then you can, you don't have to, well, you got a job, it's doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. so, and that, that's what teaching has been for me. Excuse me. <laughs> the allergy seasons are bad, right? Well, it, it, and, and what I hear is, in your story, it, not only are you curious, but there's really this loss of ego, there's this embrace of the organic, and really there's an embrace of allowing a student to be on whatever journey it is, right? Yeah. Just like in their dreams, like wherever they go, they go, and wherever you travel, you travel, and who you meet is really who you're supposed to meet. It, but then I have a question about that, because life has become really interrupted for you, and if we're gonna use the, the metaphor of travel, mm -hmm. life has been very interrupted. Cancer has come into your world. Uh, life interrupts us. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's one of the things that has taken so many people, right? And when we found out that you got sick, there was such a, just a collective like, ah, oh, no, right? So I wonder. Well, though, I, I, I would have gotten sick with cancer earlier if I don't have the friends I had. <laughs> <laughs> I was shocked that people actually liked me. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was, it was, um, I don't know, that, seriously, I was surprised. I was, I was really surprised at the number of people who really felt good about me. I didn't, I didn't think I was overly paranoid, but I guess I had been for a while. And, uh, I mean, even the administration likes me. Ever since Paul Patton came here, I don't know what got him to he got he he put a bug in their ear or something. So anyhow, uh, somebody that one of the persons here said that something about uh, his son was going taking my class and he really loved my class and stuff. And uh, I said, well, yeah. So yeah. And what what his father had said was, well, John, the students have always been a good teacher. It just takes the administration a little bit longer to catch up. <laughs> Unfortunately. No offense, Paul, but there's, there's uh, the administration has sometimes, administration and teachers are, are traditional enemies. So right. Kind of thing. But um, good administrators recognize that some of their, their best teachers are the ones that look like they're kind of on the edge. <laughs> or over, well. There's <laughs> a fine line between the edge and over the edge. Yeah. <laughs> no, there, there is a fine line. I don't know. But, but, I, your, but your teaching got disrupted uh, with your health journey. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, and, and I don't even know how to frame this question, but I guess what was kept coming to my mind was, you know, what has cancer taught you, or what are you learning in this journey? Uh, 
I'm glad I took philosophy as an undergraduate. I was a philosophy major. And uh, that gives you a sort of a sense of, I don't know, it gives you a, a little bit more familiarity with your mortality and those kind of issues and the meaning of life and all that stuff. Um, and somehow I've, I've been actually surprised at, at how well I've, or how well death is approaching. I don't know how you want to put it. There's some kind of sense of how it is. And, and actually I've been, my wife and I have both been surprised. We've gotten along really well the last three years. <laughs> In some ways, better than we have before. And uh, she's been much better at taking care of sick people than I thought she could ever be. Usually three days, and you got to get up or die. You know? <laughs> but she hasn't been like that at all. No. She's, 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 she's been really good. Uh, and uh, she's been pleased that I haven't been. Uh, well, she has a. I think, so I think she has people who support. Yeah. She has a group of, of, of people who are married to people with cancer. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm one of the best people with cancer. So. <laughs> yeah, I've heard some people in the community talk about Emma as being your, your bodhisattva, your, your uh, great support in this whole journey. That absolutely, I'm so glad it's being recognized as the great care that's being provided. But you know, you talked about also one of the things that you're learning is this overwhelming love that people have for you, the support that you've received that you never really imagined, right? Yeah. Come, people coming out of the woodwork to tell you how much well, they... It's much more of a community than I even thought it did. Than I could, I mean, that was more ideal in a sense. That, that, and that's, that's important. It's important to recognize that you have a community there. And I've always thought that it's important uh, that the, the community be sustainable mm -hmm. and can, can sustain its elders in some sense. And then, she grew with elders. I had a book, <laughs> if I like it. He talks about stages of life, and the seventh one, before the, the final eighth one, is called In the Grove of Elders. And there was a grove of box elders down there on the pond. <laughs> I was like, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and then, oh, when we were in Ecuador, I ended up in, in the, the village of shamans. I mean, it was a town that was known as the town of shamans in Ecuador. And that was completely happenstance. See, that's the thing about when you're traveling. When all your plans go awry, somebody's got a better plan. And it's you at a deeper level mm. that has a better plan than what you thought of. So that's the other thing about dreams is recognizing that there's things about you that you don't know yet that are much more important than... I think I'll do this. I think I'll buy this. Car. You know that kind of really superficial stuff, and that's that's why I like traveling. Is it, it kind of teaches you that right off the bat. I was going went down in Colombia once. And the town, well, the town's not there. Popayan, the volcano. Um, so, but Popayan, I had got. I, I was hitchhiking down through South America, Colombia, Argentina. And this was in Colombia, and I. Because I met these people, and they said they'd give me a ride, just go to the Americana Hotel. So I sat at the doorstep of this Americana Hotel all night long, right? I think, kind of shimmy in my poncho and stuff. And they never showed up. I'm like, damn. So I finally got up, go get a cup of coffee down at the town square. I'm walking down there, and there was Roger Rasnick from high school. I mean, he went, I'm like, but you can't plan, oh, I'm going to run into Roger Rasmus when I go there. No, you have to go through all that stuff, and then they show up. And that happens to me, yeah. Anyway, that, those things happen mm -hmm. when you're on the road. Those little magical kind of, where did that come from? Well, I don't know. I'll take advantage of it. That, 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 he, he gave me a cup of coffee, too, because I didn't have enough. <laughs> well, that, that begs the question, man. I mean, and this is off the script, but what you go out of here is this real ability to be flexible. Mm -hmm. And I think that my own struggle, I think many of our struggles, is when things go awry, we feel out of control, we feel very disrupted, we might feel very anxious, and, and, and we get to the place that we are kind of backstepping, and we, we miss those, like those eye-opening moments, right? Yeah. How, how have you cultivated that which almost feels like free wheeling flexibility to be okay with the change. I don't know. 
I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly how, how it's done, but it, it is, well, there is that mindfulness and that awareness kind of thing uh, that, that people talk about in terms of the Buddhist kind of thing, that mindfulness, of, that mindful awareness and stuff, and recognizing just being there in the present. And the road helps you do that, especially if it's a foreign language, because you've got to be really aware of all the nuances of where they're coming from with, without necessarily understanding the damn word they said, right? So you don't quite hear it, but you, you have to be very present in that moment with that person. And I, think, I think that I try to cultivate, and, and try to cultivate as well. I, I guess I try to model that with students. I don't know how successful I am, because I'm always, man, if there's a pile of shit in the room, I will find it in the unit's in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> That's my secret superpower. This is, this is good. This is, if you're a psychologist, you want to find the weak points, right? But you, I don't find them. They just sort of appear to me, and I go, oh, yeah, it looks like, yeah, well, they may have some issue there or something. Yeah, you've been able to, to navigate. I, but I, I don't know how not to say it, though. <laughs> well, that, that's all, we have growing edges, right? Um, yeah, no, I, I've, I've, I've unintentionally insulted lots of people. Well, uh, well you find out that... my friends. <laughs> especially are, my friends. <laughs> there are students who are absolutely mind-blown, lives change in your class, and that there are others who maybe are, are demand a very pointed, outlined lecture in one one shot color. Sometimes they struggle a little bit in the, the yeah. Howie methods. But I wonder, as we kind of come to a close here for our time, the, the image that I shared with you of, you know, you're teaching a class and we have all this material that you want to share with students, but you, it's the last day of class and you look at the clock and you realize that you got five minutes left with these students, right? What would you share? Of course, that metaphor is about life, right? What, what would you share with us to say, you know what, if I'm going to rub shoulders with John Howie, he, he wants me to know this. Follow your passion. Uh, find your path with heart, I think, is the way the First Nations people talk about. It. But, but it, it's follow your passion is, is uh, from Joseph Campbell. And one of the times that he got asked that, and, and it's also called um, follow your bliss and stuff like that. But, um, somebody asked, you know, well, what, how, how do I, how do I, how do I follow, how do I you know, follow my bliss? How do I find my passion? Yeah. And and Joseph Campbell says, well, what do you really like to do? And he said, well, I'm not really sure. He said, well, figure it out and follow it. Okay. <laughs> and that's that's you. I like to read books and I like to talk about books that I've read that I really like. That's what you get to do as a professor. That's cool. <laughs> you force people to read the same book that you're reading, and then you get to talk about it. I mean, what, what else could you ask for as a teacher? And then the, the passion that you have for your own subject. I mean, if you're teaching, you should be teaching something that you like. I mean, you've, all, you've seen, all, everybody's seen those burnout teachers that you really, they, they should have left a long time ago. <laughs> they, they really shouldn't be here anymore. <laughs> But um, fortunately, I, I'm going to be dead before I get to do that. I think you could live to be 300, and there would still be passion in there, I think. Um, that's been part of your uh, special gift, uh, of just the energy, the life, and it's becoming replicated. All these students that you've encountered and other people that you've, you've helped in, in, in some little way kind of connect to their own John Howie type energy, right? No, 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 it's their energy. It's reconnecting to who they are. And that, this psychology cheats like that, okay? Because we make them do all their dreams and, you know, their biography and where they come from. Their I can make them do their family genealogies in the first class. I mean, in the, the, the freshman class, the general side. So they find out about their own background. And that's part of the reason that I know something about the community here, I guess, is because I know the histories of these people, and I tell people, look, if your grandfather got killed by your grandma with an axe, I'm not going to remember who did what to whom. I might remember, you know, somebody killing somebody with an axe. That's pretty cool, but I'm not going to remember who it was. <laughs> <laughs> I have a good memory for forgetting, you know, who that was or something. So, and, and, that, and psychology is easier.
because you, people have to bring up all their stuff. Mm -hmm. And they have this stereotype image of, psychologists are always going to know what I'm talking about. He's going to know my unconscious stuff. And then they'll spill all their unconscious right out there in front of you and be surprised that you know about it. <laughs> I didn't know shit about it until you told me. <laughs> then it became really obvious. So, um, but that's what I think the job of the Lawrence College is, is to help people figure out what they want to do with the rest of their life, that they can be passionate about the rest of their life. And I, I, think, I think that's a possible task to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's, and I don't, I don't think it's me so much as it just kind of happens, okay? Because I'm not trying to be false and humble here, because I'm an arrogant asshole. But I just think that, that, that it doesn't have as, so much to do with me as a situation you can get them into and get, it starts moving. Mm. And a class will do that as a whole. And, that's, and you get really good classes. And then you get really not so good classes. <coughs> and then there's, there's a boom bust cycle with that. So. But, so I guess it really sounds like that kind of wrap up what you're saying. I mean, it's just this idea of just uh, letting things happen, paying attention, and then going to the, the path that you feel like you're really most passionate about. It's right, authentically being yourself yeah. is what I hear. Yeah, and you, well, you kind of care about the people. Because they, well, but that's, that just goes without saying, right? Yeah, right, yeah. That you actually have to care about which direction they go in and stuff. Uh, and the therapeutic value of, of nature and stuff, people who've known about their home place and stuff, they already have a sense of that. Everybody, I think, already has a sense of how nature can be healing. And, and especially in COVID and stuff, people say, oh yeah, well, I go out and walk in the woods and sit there. And they continue to do that after the class because, oh, yeah, I feel better. And it's, it's like you, it, it, it tends to bathe you and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's like you go down by the river, and if you hear the river, the sound of the river, that sound will make it feel like you've been gone for weeks and just had an afternoon by the river. You know, that the sound of flowing water just really, it purges your ears of, of, of the dross that you get into. Mm. And I think nature does that. And, and it's, it's really an advantage to have the natural wonders and stuff that you have around here. Right? And almost dying on the river helps, too. <laughs> Well, I know that many of you probably have other questions or things that you want to share with John. I know we're, we're at our time now, but I just want to uh, thank you. Thanks for sitting in on conversation. Um, and a lifetime can't be summarized in you know, 40 minutes or so of a conversation, but a little bit. You get a little bit of, 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 of John's flair and passion. And, uh, and we're really thankful that today is a good day that you're able to be with us and share with us. And, there are no words to express our, uh, our deepest gratitude. Uh, not for 30 years of teaching. A lot of people have done that. Um, but for you being you. Because I think that is the thing that has really helped so many other people. Is someone who's authentically, whether on purpose or not, authentically living them, being themselves, wearing a poncho, riding a bike, riding a horse to school, whatever it is that you're authentically doing, that there's something that connects with other people who long to be authentic. And that's been a real gift. So thank you so much for you being John Howie. Well, thank you, Rob. And thank you guys. Yeah, it's, it's just, yeah. I'm glad to see you guys are still here. Just take care of the ducks. <laughs> He's taking uh, care of the ducks. He's trying to take care of the ducks. You're still taking care of the ducks. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got my chickens down there. My wife's about to kill me because the one I'm just throwing. <laughs> Man, Danny Cox, I mean, they will not shut up. <laughs> well, let's give Dr. John Howie a round of applause.